be all right. A little difficult here in the West. And there are several opinions on it, even among Eastern people. We have here perhaps one of the most complicated, or we don't get practiced. It has always been my problem, wherever possible, to see how certain transitions could be made between Eastern and Western thinking for the improvement of the Westerners. This is especially difficult with Hathio. Because it involves a series of factors which may give considerable concern even to Eastern thinkers in the matter of their application. Theoretically, basically, Hatha Yoga is a step in the development of the entire yogic theory. But in practice, it often becomes an end in itself. And to the degree that it does this, I think it is detrimental both to the Easterner and the Westerner. In other words, it rotates upon a concept in which certain ethical overtones are not given perhaps their adequate importance. We mistrust profoundly any system which attempts to mechanize spiritual growth of man, or to place it under the keeping of arbitrary factors of any nature. Yet at the same time, there is in the discipline and theory of the yogas, of the yoga, a number of points that are useful to us. So we have to broaden the foundation a little, and seek for that which we can use. And perhaps the first thing that comes to mind that is important to us is the emphasis upon the relation between the person and the body. We have so long grown up in the concept that person and body are identical, that the house of the man who lives in it should be regarded as a package, as one entity. But we have lost sight of the fact that the person is more important than the body, that the person uses the body, but is not the body. And for the most part, that the uh, partnership between the person and the body is inadequate. The average individual either ignores body or becomes its servant. Either the body is comparatively unimportant to us and we live from day to day neglecting it utterly, sacrificing it to any ambition that we may have, or else we become body hypnotized. <coughs> we become gradually under the control of this instrument, so that actually the gratification of the body in its various departments becomes <coughs> the principal purpose for living. Both of these extremes are wrong, and both of these dangers are pointed out in Hatha Yoga. Yet the solution in the Eastern School is not as happy as we would like. Therefore, let us try to understand a moment the relationship between the person and the body, or the human being and his world, for both of these have certain parallels. During the medieval period of European history, the world suffered from what was known as the Black Death, or the Walking Death the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague was the result of man's complete and profound ignorance concerning sanitation. He did not realize that this difficulty was caused by rats carrying very dangerous bacteria. He did not realize that there was any relation at all between his own lack of understanding, cleanliness, sanitation, hygiene, and this curse that descended upon him. He could only assume that this plague was sent by God to punish him for his moral sins. It did not occur to him that he was being punished for his mental ignorance. 
So when this play devastated the larger part of Europe, resulting probably in some 30 to 50 million deaths in 100 years, we can reduce this pattern slightly and bring it to bear directly upon ourselves. The average person inadequately informed as to what constitutes the proper care of his own body, neglecting it, ignoring it, failing it on levels of hygiene and sanitation as an individual, opens himself to the corruptions of a body which has not been adequately and properly maintained. And the terrible point involved becomes that this body sickened with toxin without adequate thought as to its needs gradually corrodes and corrupts not only the flesh but the emotions and the mental nature which must function through this body. So the concept that the body has something to do with salvation cannot be overlooked. That the individual can ignore all the laws of material nature and rush to grasp the laws of spiritual nature. It's a false concept. Man must grow. And Hatha Yoga invites man to recognize that growth must be through effort. That the individual who wants to grow must do certain things. And that one of the things he must do is to learn to use and not abuse the body which he has received. <coughs> the body which becomes either dharmic or karmic according to his uses and misuses of its natural resources. Now that the body should be maintained in a reasonable manner is pretty obvious. So in the West we have developed calisthenics. We have created the gymnasium. We have suggested setting up exercises and setting down exercises. We are now concerned largely with food intake, uh, the devitalized this and the adulterated that. <laughs> uh, we are profoundly and deeply moved and worried over small because it pollutes the air, but we constantly overlook the fact that 99 persons out of 100 do not know how to breathe. So small goes no small. A great many individuals die of suffocation. So the effect of the sound mind in the sound body is more or less the underlying concept behind the principles of Hatha Yoga. But these principles have gone appeal, and now you have almost anything from what we might term uh, calisthenics and uh, gymnastics in the West, all the way to psychic phenomena, spiritualism, and uh, numerous other mysterious arts and sciences. But to, uh, to come to our essential problem, in the West we are concerned with finding a way to liberate man from his body. I don't mean necessarily to separate the one from the other. We can do that by making a flight and stay across the street. But the, uh, the problem of the individual achieving a freedom within the body, a freedom from body, while still he inhabits it. The Greeks were well aware of the fact that the only freedom man can enjoy in a universe ruled by law is an harmonious adjustment with that law. As long as the individual does not break a law, he does not know that it exists. He lives happily ever after until he breaks the law, or thinks he does. Or immediately that he goes contrary to law, the law moves and breaks him. So that, to a degree, Adi Yoga, with its various physical and psychical implications, <coughs> is an important part of religious philosophy. It is important to man's spiritual salvation that he knows how to walk, how to sit, what to eat, when to eat it, how to breathe. These things are important to him spiritually as well as physically. Now in the West, when we develop an athletic attitude, we become obsessed by it. We begin to strengthen the body, we begin to take such good care of it, that practically every resource that we have mentally and emotionally goes to taking care of the body. This does not produce this emancipation we desire. The individual simply becomes body-obsessed. 
<coughs> he begins to have his picture taken with his muscles flexed and considers that he has now become a model example of something. <laughs> How ideal is the body shall become the pedestal upon which the person stands, it shall advance his cause, it shall be useful to him, and he is to have a constructive relationship with it at all times. Tanti Yoga then offers the problem of thoughtfulness concerning the need of the body. It causes the individual gradually to reach a point in which he instinctively, subconsciously, almost unconsciously, preserves bodily equilibrium. Now we will realize that in India this is not the primary purpose. But there we have another problem that goes very closely into the athletic attitude of the West. We have a sort of psychic athletics over there, uh, which cause certain phenomenal processes, certain experimentations, and peculiar particular psychic chemistries produced by the discipline of Hatha Yoga to become supreme, which they really are not. There is our difficulty there. But with this thinking, we go to the next problem. In any subject which we wish to attain proficiency, what is required? First, aptitude. Second, discipline. Some individuals are so constituted that advancement beyond a certain point in any art or science will be extremely difficult. Others do not attain simply because they do not give the necessary continuous attention to the thing they are doing. And the problem of handling the body is one of disciplining the mind and the emotions and preserving the equilibrium of the body against the tyranny of these over parts. The body can be destroyed by the mind and emotions just as easily as it can clog them. The harmonious relationship of these elements is something greatly to be desired. Now, when we approach discipline, therefore, on a philosophic level, we are not working basically with inhibitions. We are not working with frustrations. We are working always with the channeling of things to their proper and normal uses. The normal body becomes a good and useful instrument for the attainment of other things. As such, it must be and should be maintained by the person who wishes to go further in philosophical discipline. And because the body is governed to the average person, because its requirements are inconvenient to him, because it would rest when he would not rest, because it requires a certain patience which he finds difficult in developing, the body presents a magnificent problem of discipline. Now we have the same kind of thing, quite, at least quite a parallel case, in the blessings bestowed by the small child in the family. Children can be a tremendous cause of irritation, <coughs> exhaustion, despair, fear, doubt, worry, fatigue, everything you can think of. And yet, the family as a unit is one of the world's greatest instruments of discipline. It gives the individual an opportunity to grow under challenge, and to administer the unknown effectively and efficiently. The body gives the same general situation. The body is the first thing with which man can work to prove that he intends to make a science out of his own living. If he cannot conquer the body, he will not conquer the universe. If he cannot bring it into some kind of a moderate, reasonable, normal pattern, he can scarcely expect that his ideas and attitudes are going to change the course of human history. The difficulty, of course, is that there is nothing less glamorous to work with than ourselves. The great glamour is when we honestly feel that we are about to change the course of other persons' lives. That's glamorous. But changing the course of our own is not glamorous. And uh, perhaps the discipline is all the better because maybe no one but ourselves will ever recognize it. Although in time others are probably going to notice it also. So when those people are de uh, devoted to advanced thinking in general, 
We find 99 who wish to convey to others noble ideas, to one who wishes to convey them to himself and do something about them. So here is this one. The discipline of the individual beginning with himself and proving conclusively that he has put his own house in order before he goes out trying to change the course of other persons' lives and living. Now what is this thoughtfulness? Why should we be thoughtful? Well, most of our troubles come from thoughtlessness. Most of our great misfortunes in life are the result of acting before we think or before we have given mature contemplation <laughs> to the thing we are doing. We have allowed our appetites, our emotions, our thinking, our feelings to escape us. Later we bite our tongue and wish we hadn't spoken, but it's too late. We have. Perhaps we can undo the damage, perhaps we cannot. Certainly we were not self-disciplined. The body can be, and therefore should be, the symbol of our distinct and determined resolution to integrate our own resources. Now, there are many ways in which these things can be done. In India, various techniques and methods involve the individual proving through practices in which he indulges that he is able uh, to do things which would normally be uncomfortable, unpleasant, and perhaps impossible, simply by the complete resolution of his own consciousness that these things shall be done. He gradually learns, for example, to remove pain from various parts of his body. He's able to withdraw nerve sensation. He is able to go on usual periods of time without food. He's able at will to control many practices and habits that with most of us are involuntary. He can change the pace of his heart at will. He has gradually exercised a certain power over the functions of his own body. And he has learned how this is done through a certain disciplining of breathing, <coughs> attention focused by concentration upon various parts of the body, and by carrying energy upon breath to various elements or sections or structures of his own nature. Thus he is able consciously to control nutrition, consciously to control digestion, <coughs> consciously to regulate internal functions normally autonomic. By these means, he indicates little by little that he is able to govern and rule this body, that it will do as he requires, and that at all times he is master of it. Now, the attainment of this end is not primarily useful because merely the body is controlled. It is because of the power to control is attained by the individual. It means that he has gradually learned not only to turn these various forces upon his body, but to control the sources of these forces within himself and through his own thought and his own contemplative power to control the, the <coughs> functions of his nervous system and the various functions and structures of his body. All of this is an excellent testing ground, an excellent way of demonstrating the intensification of conscious resources and how the individual will attain the control of them. Unfortunately, in too many instances, however, this becomes the end of the person who can produce a certain kind of physical, psychological, or psychical phenomena is regarded as an adept of Hatha Yoga. Actually, this, when this occurs, uh, it is a blind alley. It is not going to achieve the ends which we wish to achieve, namely the gradual growth of the person to his own spiritual state. The very discipline becomes a stumbling block. And here we have Hatha Yoga occupying a position that corresponds with science in the West. It is the whole scientific of the yogas and is not too different in its implications. <coughs> Uh, from our modern scientific attitude in general. By science, we gain the exact knowledge of doing certain things. By science in the West, we can preach miracles. 
miracles of the problem of his son than an Eastern uh, yogi if he saw them. But the ends are not mature. The reasons for these uh, phenomenal occurrences are not worthy of the energies we are using. <laughs> and uh, the achievement of the incredible becomes a fascination, becomes an end in itself. So that if we split the atom, we really think we have achieved something. All of this emphasis upon technique can leave us very cold, weak, and helpless, unless we have something else, something else, something deeper, something wiser, something greater, more noble, moving within the structure of consciousness as we understand it day by day. But let us uh, let us think for a moment in terms of a few simple. Uh, concepts of how this idea of discipline can be useful to us. Uh, discipline requires for its real function <coughs> this continuing remembrance of the law. In other words, it means that gradually the rules of life and the rules of living become subconscious in us. When this occurs, we instinctively obey them. And it is this instinctual obedience, this, gradually, this gradual dying out of even the impulse to disobey, that brings the person ultimately into an harmonious adjustment with the plan which uh, controls him and directs his activities. The West is without this instinctive adjustment. When we try to be good in the West, we really make a project out of it. We make a project so terrific that not only do we annoy ourselves out of base, we become a miserable uh, element in the entire social pattern. The process of trying to be good is the West's most disagreeable location. <laughs> it is completely exhausting to all concerned. And we do not end by being good. We end either by, by being frustrated or utterly rough. We get a kind of psychic condition of being muscle-bound. <laughs> or perhaps we uh, approach it in a different way and simply become so fearful that what we call virtue is nothing but fear of the disaster resulting from uh, vice. Our attitudes are wrong, basically, in all of these particulars. The process of being good, of unfolding naturally, like life around us, of accepting and using energy as it, is, as it is intended to be used. All of these requirements involve a gradual recognition of a gracious relationship with space. It is not a battle. It is not that we are forever fighting our lower natures, God forbid. It is that the individual is moving triumphantly toward a larger realization of values. He is not overcoming his vices one by one. He is not fighting them out to the bitter end. He is growing. And by the natural processes of growth, he outgrows the old and grows into the new without conflict. Why then, in the West, is 90% of progress accompanied by conflict? The reason is that the individual lacks the Eastern concept of how to grow. And uh, I think Kathy Yoga can give us something that is useful in explaining to us how to grow. We make a project in the West of a particular. If we decide that we're going to grow in the West, we put all our attention on the process of growing. Growth becomes a fetish. If we decide that we are going to be wise in the West, we study, we research, we examine, we attend school, we do everything possible and make this uh, wisdom problem an obsessing, completely absorbing pros progress or prospect of some nature. If we think we're going to be spiritual, or think there's any hope of it, we <laughs> submerge ourselves in this desperate effort to be spiritual. We neglect our friends. We look down our noses at the individuals who do profane and ordinary things. 
We have no longer time for friendship. We have no longer time for that little gathering somewhere or for relaxation. We've just got to be good and we've got to work at it every minute. <laughs> And you're not good at the end of that time. We're just nervous wrecks. <laughs> we often have great trouble converting other persons to our beliefs because it is so obvious that these beliefs are gradually destroying us. Why should anyone else want them? <laughs> in the contemplative approach, as we, as we understand it in the Eastern way of life, the individual does not go after these things in this aggressive, militant, dominant, western mode. He realizes that growth and the <coughs> development of wisdom, the development of understanding, the release of spiritual resource through the individual, all of these things are perfectly natural. The problem is not to try to make it happen. The difficulty has been that we've spent thousands of years building Western civilization to make sure it couldn't happen. The whole thing has been that we have built resistance to one to one under the delusion or illusion that that is the way we will get it. So we come back again to this problem that we mentioned before, these the simple words of the Bible which probably give us more clue to it internal growth than anything else in Western religious writing, and that is the simple statement, be still and know. Now, Hatha Yoga has to do with the body being still. It has to do with the gradual relaxation of tension and the removal of all obstructions within the body to the free circulation of life. <laughs> Wherever we have disease in the human body, we have obstruction. Wherever we have obstruction, we have conflict. And when life in its natural and free motion in space is prevented from achieving its motion by some circumstance or condition, unnatural or unreasonable, then we begin to have tension. We have pressure. We have the gradual rise of negative elements and factors. In the body, we know this through elimination. We know that if the individual fails in his elimination of processes, that the whole body and finally the psychic economy will be injured. And there's many an um, example of what appears to be bad thinking or emotional upset is simply due to lack of proper elimination. So in these things, our problem is to relax pressures and to increase the normal, natural distribution of resources. Or if this has been disturbed already, then the therapeutic phase of how the yoga comes in. And there are many elements in this particular discipline that would be of the greatest use to the Western position. Because one of its valuable parts is its ability to create something we need, desperately requiring the West, and that is a method of therapy which the individual can use upon himself. In other words, through Hatha Yoga, the intelligent uh, mystic can become his own physician, taking care of nearly all of even those more obscure ailments for which the West has yet as most inadequate methods of treatment. So there are many phases to this. But let us begin now in thinking it out for the average Western person. Very few Westerners reach middle life without some bodily difficulty. Whether they realize it or not, it is present. This bodily difficulty is going to gradually intensify and increase, shortening the period of existence of human life. The human being requires approximately 21 years to reach maturity. By every reasonable analogy in nature, his length of life should be at least 150 years. During most of that time, he should be efficient. He should be able to handle within himself most of the waters by which bodily injuries and infirmities, uh, satisfied vitality and destroying his efficiency. Yet as a matter of fact, from the day he is born, the day he dies, he is continuously building up difficulty for himself. He is building up the uh, <coughs> physical difficulty, <coughs> and through the misuse of 
abuse of body is destroying his mental and emotional functions and faculties. So in order that he may have the maximum experience, that he may live for the enlightenment of his inner life, he should and must begin at first gently, and perhaps later a little more scientifically and assiduously, uh, the disciplining and organization of his bodily resources. So for a Westerner, a very simple problem in how to yoga could be the division and arrangement of his time. So we have a time allotment. A <coughs> day, we'll say 24 hours a day in which to do various things. And it said that the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the great Muslim leader, divided his day into three parts. One part of which was to rest and repose, one for the service of his people, and the third for the improvement of himself, or the worship of his God. Now, in the division of the day into three parts, the individual is doing something that not one in a hundred of us is able to accomplish. He is beginning to integrate or organize resources. So I would say that for the simple Westerner who is not yet ready to breathe uh, in one nostril and out the other, or something of that nature, to the beginning of Hatha Yoga can be <coughs> the putting in order of this problem of the day. To what degree do we viciously sacrifice balance in the process of satisfying ambitions, feelings, impulses, urges, appetites? How many individuals are able to control their own periods of work and rest? Now some will say that they cannot because of the type of employment that they have. This is for the most part, however, an excuse. There are rare examples where the individual must reorganize his plan because of the circumstances of his economic survival. But even here, these changes must be organized, not permitted simply to happen. But assuming that the individual has uh, some kind of a balanced life, reasonably balanced, that he works a certain amount of time, rests a certain amount of time. Does he do these things in a manner suitable to maintain his own greatest efficiency? Is he doing it thoughtfully, purposefully, intentionally? Or is he simply drifting upon the surface of habits? Is he simply doing what everyone else does for no good reason? Now, the average American lacks balance in the distribution of his time. Some bring their work home and worry about it all night. Others bring home to the office and worry about that all day. <laughs> the average person becomes a little thoughtful, forgets how to play. The individual becomes really a uh, uh, player, forgets how to work. And the individual who works and plays and does all these things forgets how to live. And if he does his other activities sufficient with sufficient intensity, forgets how to sleep. <coughs> to bring these things into patterns, so that the various parts of the personality have their reasonable opportunities. But the individual has a way of controlling his own activity, controlling his own thoughts, controlling his own appetites, doing those things which he knows to be reasonable and right. And when the time comes, refraining from doing those things which are unreasonable. Now this takes thoughtfulness. The individual must give a little time and attention to the organization and integration of his own life. Ninety-nine out of a hundred persons interested in advanced thinking do not know how to relax. They are so intent upon their spiritual growth that they are perfectly willing to sacrifice the sleep they need, the work they should be doing, to the simple process what they believe the indispensable process of becoming good. But at the sacrifice of work and rest, nobody can become good. That's the important thing. Something goes to pieces instead. And the individual trying very desperately to be good ends up by being very neurotic and very irritable. So here is discipline imposed upon contract. Begin quietly. Arrange your day. Arrange your rest and your work. Arrange your time so that the various phases of your nature are brought into activity in a balanced manner. 
You do are engaged in the daytime in some highly intellectual pursuit. Your avocational time should be much more along artistic and cultural lines. If you are spending most of your day in some art, then you will need strong intellectual avocational interests. You should balance. Working distinctly and definitely to see that the whole nature is properly taken care of. At the same time, a fair amount of thought and care in connection with nutrition, proper consideration for rest and repose, enough control so that you do not allow yourself to become fatty and do things to your body which are not good for it, simply because of fashions, because of the requirements of style and that type of thing, to gradually recover from the meaningless and purposeless compromises with society around you not to an extreme, but to a reasonable degree, so that you are not injuring yourself in order to please people who are not worth pleasing. Little by little, you will find that the organization of life, the balance of it, relaxation when it is proper, work when it is proper, rest when it is needed, proper nutrition when it is obviously required. When these things all work together, instead of working against each other, what happens? You do not have the feeling that you are a perfectly organized creature, a well-running machine. No, you do not. You suddenly have the feeling that you, as a human being, no longer need to be concerned about yourself. Gradually, through this kind of integration, you lose self-awareness. Because there is nothing for you, nothing in Nothing to constantly make you mentally or emotionally or physically conscious. You no longer have to say to yourself, oh, well, there goes my old temper again. Or you do not have to say, I just wish I could stop worrying. You gradually become unaware of the working of your own structure as soon as this structure is operating correctly. Thus your mind and your emotions and your energies are relieved from the problem of being constantly self-aware. Now self-awareness is the opposite end of that which should be attained by yoga. Self-awareness, regardless of the cause, is the constant focusing of attention upon the person. It, it, it makes no difference, really, whether you go around saying, I, 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 all the time, which is an obvious form of egoism, or whether without having said the word or anything, you are body conscious, mind conscious, and, and emotion conscious, constantly. I know people that never talk about anything except themselves, and yet at the same time, they are not really consciously egotist. <coughs> they are not saying, I'm good, I'm great. But they are saying, I'm sick, I'm miserable, oh, if I hadn't done that, oh, if I'd only done something else, the I still becomes the focal point. I'm so sorry, I'm so tired, I'm so worried, I'm so frightened. And whether it is in an aggressive form of egotism or not, it's always I, I, I. Everything is focused upon the I. If you have the misfortune to hit your thumb with a hammer, it's very difficult to keep your mind off your thumb for a few moments. <laughs> the pain draws your attention there. It is also very difficult to keep your, your thinking away from your own worries if you worry all the time. You cannot detach from them. Your energies become more and more turned in upon this little egocentric problem. And so, you are eye-conscious all the time. Not because you're so proud of yourself, perhaps you're ashamed of yourself, but you're still on your own mind all the time. And how the yoga will tell you that all in all, functions never are as adequate when the mind is on them as when the mind is on something else. If your mind could, by extension of consciousness, be set upon only reality, every function of your emotion, thoughts, and body would be known. Because there would then be complete detachment. This detachment means there would be complete freedom from the offense of our own pressure upon ourselves. 
we would no longer be constantly pushing ourselves around, which is the favorite activity of the average person. Whether we are flattering ourselves or blaming ourselves, whether we are saying how good we are or striving desperately to act some more, which is a hard job for most of us, <laughs> we are still thinking of nothing but this. It's all going into this internal package. Now another group of persons believe they can solve it by going around all the time and saying, I am perfection. I am infinite abundance. <laughs> but it's still I, I, I all the time. <laughs> Whether we're rich or poor, success or failure, everything is this little package set in I. You very seldom get a good recovery from sickness or anything of that nature while the individual just sits around and thinks about himself. Very common form of nervous breakdown involves a certain amount of cardiac difficulty where the heart becomes a little irregular or we have tachycardia or drop beat or something of that nature. When this happens, the individual becomes what we commonly call a pulse taker. He's always wondering whether his heart's still beating or not. <laughs> <laughs> he's completely unaware of the fact that if it wasn't going, he wouldn't be able to grab home. <laughs> And that is an excessive form of this same problem. We become hypercritical, hyperwatchful, mm -hmm. always expecting we're going to make the same we do, always wondering, worrying, thinking, everything locked in ourselves. Now, naturally and normally, such a situation is bound to produce tremendous bodily difficulties. And the answer to a large part of this is the gradual understanding of what is necessary in order to relax. So we come to another important phase of happy yoga on the physical side, and that is the power to relax. Now, how do we relax? There have been books written on it. Most people are nervous wrecks by the time they finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> there are all kinds of rules and suggestions and recommendations about relaxing. Relaxation, however, does not actually begin with the body. Relaxation begins with the mind. Relaxation is a problem of the mind letting go of false tension. And the individual most likely to be able to live in a relaxed condition is one who has an internal growth sufficient to bring about a balance or at least some degree of harmony between the impulses and instincts of fear and faith. The person who is fearful can never relax. The individual whose faith is strong enough will seldom if ever be tense. Thus faith, which is the internal immediate apperception of a good, whether it is known or understood or not, brings with it relaxation. Relaxation comes then from a general condition of consciousness and is transferred to the body. And the individual who has integration within himself will be relaxed physically. So we hear people talk about integration and reveal tension. Therefore, the integration is not real, but the tension is. Unless the internal life produces an effect consistent with itself, then that internal is not correctly understood or correctly applied. It must produce the needed results. Relaxation in man begins with the cultivation of his own internal values. The individual must be bigger than his problem or he will be in a state of tension. When he is larger than his problem, the problem dissolves and the tension dissolves. This is one of the reasons why the development of an internal life is so vital to the individual. Without it, he can never escape the plagues which burden the external life. For disease actually originates within man and is a disease of his own consciousness. And where this consciousness is uncomfortable, it will manifest as physical infirmity on some level or other. Now, in carrying on still further with this uh, thinking, we come to another important consideration. What sustains man? 
What is the physical source of the human being's efficiency? And we must answer that the physical source of this efficiency is an eternal and ever available life essence. This life essence is universally diffused in all things that live. May be likened to a river. In the Chinese philosophy, it's likened to the Yangtze, the great mother of rivers. And along the shores of this river, on all sides down the banks, are the little villages. And out on the river are the little boats, the fishermen who gather their food from the river, the farmer who plants along the side of the river and uses it for irrigation, the villages that need the water. Everything depends upon the river for survival. In man and in the universe, there is an ever-flowing river in space, the river of energy, the river of life force. And all things exist and develop and survive because of the availability of this life force. Man exists because he has within his own consciousness certain distributing centers by means of which this life force is gathered and then distributed through his body through his Yangtze River, which is, of course, his great arterial venous system. The blood carries life, the nerves carry life, the breath carries life. And just as life is born also in the rays of the sun, everything depends upon one life for its survival. As a great city must be sustained by a vast water supply, and sometimes it is necessary to go, as in the case of Los Angeles, we are contemplating even going to the, car, to the Columbia River and bring water all that way. And we've already gone uh, to the Colorado River for water. We have to have water for this enormous city. Man lives by life, a water of life. And his entire activity, whether it is physical, vital, emotional, or mental, all depend upon this universal life principle. This principle, in its normal and natural function, is available to man. It is available to him at all times. It is always present in him, or he could not live. But man is a very intricate structure. And in very few human beings is the distribution of this life principle complete and adequate. In each human being it is incomplete for some reason or other. It is incomplete because man is incomplete. He first of all could not distribute the entire energy field. He is not attuned to it. But those parts that he is attuned to, in their distribution through him, are variously conditioned. And this conditioning is due to the possibility and the factuality that the human being, by psychosomatic tensions, is able to constantly influence the distribution of energy for himself. He can, by a single thought, block energy. He can, by another thought, release energy. He can deprive certain areas of his nature of energy by what we might term archetypal thinking, archetypal emotions. Every feeling that we have as an emotional being and every thought that we have as a mental being have, in some way, physical polarities in our structure. These physical polarities reacting to psychic stress open and close doors in our physical, vital circulation. As a result of that, our habits, our patterns, our attitudes, our policies are all to a degree resulting in an imbalanced distribution of energy. Every time we are angry, and we create within ourselves a situation as unpleasant as the uh, fission of an atomic bomb. A temper-fitted man is as dangerous as an atomic bomb in the world. All 
the pressures that we have, the ability of emotions and thoughts, all of these affect the distribution of the life agent through the human body. Every attitude we have also sets up habit patterns in structure. And while it is a little difficult to understand, perhaps immediately, all the implications of this subject, one of the things that we finally learn is that most of the distribution of man's energy field uh, results from a condition arising in what might be termed the upper abdominal cavity. There are nerves of, and nerve centers in the abdominal area which control almost completely the distribution of this universal energy field upon which man is so dependent. These energy fields tie in directly with his psychic life as a person. And we know that there isn't a single mood that the human being can possibly hold that does not either increase or decrease and in one way or another unbalance his vital magnetic field. Thus, the person is constantly revealing his character by means of the imbalancing of the distribution of vitality. <coughs> to do this over a period of time and to create powerful habit patterns that become autonomic or automatically repetitional means gradually to set up uh, involuntary patterns which remain, which continue to grow and continue to build until finally they can uh, create almost a scar in the vital structure of the body and from that time on energy no longer distributes adequately through that area or through that part of the body. For example, grief. It held as an emotional intensity by the individual decreases the available energy field of the heart. We say people can die of broken heart. They can. Not because the heart breaks, but because of a sympathy between an attitude and a distribution of energy. And the chronic ailments that we suffer from physically are nearly all the gradual symbolism set up by chronic attitudes which deflect and dis uh, the distribution of energy. So, basically, energy becomes the principal cause of health or sickness. For wherever it is normal, the individual is normal. But when it is depleted or obstructed, then any one of a hundred different situations may be set up due to the failure of the protective structural mechanisms. So that there is one kind of health but there are hundreds of kinds of sickness. And wherever there is a natural tendency or a debility, or the devitalized person is exposed to contagion or infection, he is more likely to be affected. So the <coughs> preservation of energy, the keeping open of all the natural channels of energy, and if they have been blocked in some way, their reopening, and the reorganization of their resources. These are important elements in how they open. And how does the average Westerner work with this to try to achieve a certain amount? On the symbolic level, he is trying to do it with vitamins. And the vitamin theory comes very, very close, symbolically, to his big problem. But what he doesn't realize is that no matter how many vitamins he takes in, the greatest source of vitamins is always within himself. He is using these vitamins because he does not know how to release his own vitality. He doesn't know how to get at it. Or because he believes that these special forms of nutrition uh, will support the failure of vitality within his structure. Now, vitality never fails. This is an illusion of man. 
Vitality cannot fail because it is universal. What fails is the rapport between vitality and the individual. He cuts himself off from vitality. And he does so by damaging the instruments through which the distribution of vitality takes place. When he has damaged the instruments, it is like throwing his radio set out of tube. He will no longer receive the program, but that does not mean that the broadcasting station has stopped. The broadcasting station never stops. But the individual can tune his own vehicle in or out of that program. The moment he becomes tense, he tunes out. The moment he relaxes, he begins to tune in again. So tension blocks the, the, the flow of essential energy. Now in the West, we make a, a virtue out of aggressive attitudes that are essentially tense. We say the individual isn't really trying unless he's practically muscle-bound with the effort. <laughs> unless he's half sick, he's not doing a day's work. Unless he has practically come to a nervous breakdown, he's not faithful to his employment. <laughs> we reward people because of the tremendous activity they are passing through rather than because of any accomplishment. I remember a man who used to employ men. He said he didn't want to see any man sitting around in his office. He says, what do you want them to do? Parker said to him, he said, I don't care what they do, but they've got to keep at it. <laughs> More or less, the attitude that we have. We, are, we believe that we will be suspected of being alive because we are active. It seems to be the only proof that we have. <laughs> Actually, we are defeating life by this tremendous aggressive because the whole yogic program is finally to bring the individual into at one moment with the universal reality. And as surely as the higher yogas <coughs> teach man to be still and know the universal in the mind or in the emotions, so Hatha Yoga says the universal must be experienced in the body. The eternal the great law of all must not only be released to the mind and to the emotions, but the human body must become the body of this Lord. The human being must give not only his inner life, but also his outer life. And of course, in the West, we try to get rid of the outer life, throw it away, sacrifice it, humiliate it, um, and pass through various processes by which we uh, become ascetics in the sense of frustrating the outer life in order that the inner life may have its full place in our experience. But it is much wiser to assume that as we wish the eternal to be revealed through our inward parts, so likewise it must be revealed through the outward part. For just as the body of the universe is the body of a blessed God, so the body of man becomes the body of his own consciousness. And when it has been brought into such order that it releases and expresses and reveals this inner consciousness, then the body is no longer a problem to us. It is an instrument. It is a useful and proper servant of our great purpose. And it is just as important that consciousness be revealed through body as through thought or deed. And it is revealed through body in the terms of the absolute harmony and integration of body the body becomes ensouled by a universal power. And that in this way it becomes capable of being immediately available to the will, to the consciousness, to the mind and the emotions for the fulfillment of their own numerous activities. Now,